Hello, everyone. I am Mark L. Vincent. I direct the Convene Consulting Network, and as such, I get to have wonderful conversations with expert persons who talk about what they know and how they help organizations, and we all learn along the way. And today, uh, a man that I have really grown to appreciate, Matthew Painter, is going to talk with me for a while today as we look at executive leader development. Uh, and Matt has a particular point of view here because you're doing this at a university level. You've been thinking about curriculum and how it's done, how it's rolled out, how you actually measure learning. Uh, and you've got a particular uh, venue here in doing it with healthcare as well, which is a, a field where leaders are emerging or failing right now. So we'll have a chance to talk about that as well. But Matt, uh, thank you uh, for joining me for this conversation. I am so happy to be here. It's one of my favorite topics, uh, so as you know. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, good. And let's just get right at it. Um, because of the work that you do, you've got as much insight as anybody that I know into the sameness and the differences with all kinds of leadership and organizational development curricula and experiences. So I think it'd be great if you could give us what we might call a quick and dirty primer here uh, for what these are, maybe even point to where, how we can recognize what is quality and, and what is not. Yes, yeah, so when I think about organization development, we're really thinking about systemic alignment of talent with the organization. So we're talking about the mission, the strategy, uh, vision, values, and so forth, and how the talent and those two things or all those things come together. So it's really a, a systemic approach to organizational health. Uh, you can think in some ways balance scorecard, if you will. Oh, okay. But it's really the alignment of all those things going together. Um, and then when you think about like leadership development, that's like one element of our organization's health. Um, it's a conduit, if you will. We're investing in leadership skills so that that alignment can happen more naturally. Um, but really organization development is the higher arching discipline and making all those things work together, uh, particularly around how our talent interfaces with the business. So if we're going down that lane of, of things like balance scorecard, ways of measuring and tracking and mapping it out. Uh, maybe we could make a distinction here between leadership development in general, like helping somebody be a leader, lead more effective, lead themselves, manage themselves, manage a department, all that. And the person who is specifically learning to be an executive and to develop their capacity as an executive. Mm -hmm. What is the distinction there? Man, this is a, this is a deep topic here. So leadership, as you know, I mean, we can talk about like, what does it mean to be a leader all day? Like, I mean, it's just really can be really complicated. A lot of different skills associated with leading. Um, we can talk about different layers in the organization. What does it mean to be a supervisor? How does, it, what does it, how does a supervisor lead? How does a middle manager lead? All those things. And so uh, from a management perspective, you know, as you, as you transcend that hierarchy, your, your skills and your expectations shift. Um, and so what skills are needed for each of those different transitions and so forth? So um, there's in some ways leadership skills that may apply to all of those layers, but maybe in different percentages too. So if we are talking about executive development, we're really talking more maybe conceptual and, and people and visioning and strategy and so forth. But that might be a very different conversation or different skill set for middle managers and supervisors. So um, we're really just trying to think about, you know, what are we trying to accomplish and for whom? And so that's one of the things I have to ask myself all the time is mm. what does each of these different stakeholding groups need as we're trying to build these different leadership skills? So can I just go a little bit more deep with that? I, I, you're making me think about talent optimization systems yeah. and uh, what I've learned about them, things like predictive index, for instance, mm -hmm. they are paying attention both to the person mm -hmm. and then to the role. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're kind of trying to ratchet it, tighten it up, mm -hmm. not to make a person just a cog that fits to what the organization requires, but to be able to see where the fit is, to be able to make that adjustment. And so there are some mandated things to the role. Mm -hmm. There are some things that the person brings and then their own dreams and aspirations. 
Uh, and then there are some general things that just need to happen everywhere. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, I just wanted to kind of s- describe that and make sure that I'm kind of following along what, with what you're saying, that there is a lot of it depends here, <laughs> not just, oh, well, here's the difference and here's the formula, follow it. I, am I right? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't look at it as a boilerplate in any way, shape or form. And so uh, when I'm when I'm thinking about like succession planning, I'm, li- I'm also thinking leadership development. To me, they're very much the same thing. Mm. Um, and so when we're investing in leadership skills, that's great. Everybody needs leadership skills, but we also have to take in consideration where is that person going? Are we, are we preparing them for a particular role? And if so, what does success look in, like in that role? And what is that gap between that role and that person? Uh, so then it becomes much more tailored. It's, it's much more developmental for that particular person. Um, whereas a lot of times what, what, what I do is, you know, a lot of potentially programmatic things, we're, we're kind of giving broad-based skills. Um, but when we're talking about mapping it to a particular trajectory or career mm-hmm. ladder, we need to be more, a little bit more specific or intentional about that. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. So let's just kind of take the conversations we're having right now and move it specifically into healthcare. Yeah. Uh, you've got some uh, purview there, and it's certainly an industry where maybe because of the space it applies, uh, occupies in, in our economy and maybe all this stuff is happening now because of the COVID era. Um, there's a lot of disruptions. There's a lot of uncertainties. There's a lot of stuff we don't know. The economics of it are really messy. Um, what, what do you notice about those who are leading well in healthcare right now? And, and maybe what are some lessons that we can take from those who are leading well uh, and apply it to our own marketplace realities? Yeah, I can tell you that anticipation is probably the best the best element of leading well in any type of volatile industry. I mean, you really have to kind of anticipate what's happening. You, you, we can't predict, but we can anticipate different scenarios. And I think healthcare, the people that are leading well in healthcare are the ones saying, this might happen, this can happen, what if this happens? Um, and really creating contingencies and, and really investing in adaptability and thinking about all those different types of scenarios um, it's about um, crisis management. You know, we didn't. Nobody anticipated a pandemic coming. Um, and by and large, I think healthcare is good at responding to crisis. It's kind of how a lot of us are wired. Um, there's a problem, we solve it. You know, every patient that comes in, for example, has a problem. We solve problems. We're really good at that. So all all hands come on deck. We solve the problem. Um, and so I think that when you're talking about the healthcare and how healthy um, talking about performance, we're talking about adaptability, environmental scanning, um, transparency, like being transparent with people, because if they're, if they're feeling like they don't understand or they don't know, that creates a lot of fear and anxiety. Um, and then that, that kind of dovetails into um, not wanting to participate or fearful of participation. Um, so those are some elements that I think are really important in terms of who's leading in the healthcare front. Thank you. Uh, so Healthcare would be one area where culture matters then because of all of the the craziness. Mm -hmm. And you have pointed here to the difference between um, just planning and then scenario planning. But you are touching on multi-scenario planning, simultaneous, Mm -hmm. multi-ongoing scenario planning. Mm -hmm. That requires an effective culture uh, or people wear out. There has to be a bolstering of people, uh, the capacity to have strategic thinking valued and so forth. Uh, Because of the role that you occupy at a university, you're talking with all kinds of folks in their organizations and their marketplaces. So can you sharpen our insight a bit here uh, about what a strong workplace culture really does look like and what you see developing right now? Yeah, I think strong workplace culture, um, I like to think of it as defined by the organization itself. Um, The organization needs to define what their ideal or their best culture is. Um, For healthcare and maybe an organization I'm familiar with, it might be adaptability and innovation because that's what we need. Uh, that may not be unlike a lot of companies, but it's it's really in for them to decide. Um, what I what I really see, I I believe, is that we're not as far as like my field and OD and leadership development. Like I don't think that we're 
um, mature, we haven't matured as a profession enough, uh, meaning that I don't think corporate America has caught up to the discipline that we can provide. Um, so I think that there's a lot of um, organizations out there that want to invest in leadership development without really understanding what that even means, or they think it means one thing. Um, so they want to hire a leadership development person to come in and boost culture, or change their culture, um, even though that's really short-sighted. I mean, that person can make great strides in doing leadership development, absolutely. But again, going back to our organization development conversation, if you really want systemic change, if you want to really invest in culture, you really have to have an OD mindset. And that requires OD investment, uh, not just one element of, say, leadership development or learning or whatever it is. And so um, I don't think that we've caught up. I think that um, we really need more executive level understanding about what OD actually is. Mm. And it often comes down to those executives mm -hmm. learning, mm -hmm. striking the posture of, uh, I can't even begin to assume that I know that I've arrived um, and to then choose very wisely about their availability and where they're going to go deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, without that, then they're missing it. And you just, in fact, I'd like you to talk about this just a little bit more, Matt, you just opened that door to investment questions. Mm -hmm. So I think executives understand investment in infrastructure mm -hmm. and they seem to understand the costs of doing business, which might tie to talent procurement. Mm -hmm. It might tie to service development or R and D and those kinds of mm -hmm. things. But when it comes to, the in ongoing investment of people to develop them, their leadership skill and so forth. It's really hard to quantify what is appropriate and to figure it out. And it probably does differ a little bit from marketplace to marketplace. But if, if um, an executive were sitting across the desk from you today and said, how do I, I don't want anybody to know this, but I don't have the answer. How should I even begin to figure out how to invest? Like, like, what's the formula or where do I start to be able to be more attentive to the OD thing? What would you say to them? Well, a couple of things. I mean, you don't have to know the answer. I mean, that's why we have OD people. I mean, OD people can be your best friend. A good OD person is going to be your partner. Uh, they're going to help you navigate all those answers. And then what I would do is start asking them where the, where they would like to, to end up. Like, what's their cultural aim? Like, what's the vision? Um, and then try to understand the value system that's kind of underlying all of that. Because if somebody asks me, if I'm if my exe if executives are asking me about culture, I'm gonna be talking about value system. Like, what are, your, what are your values? And how do you want those to show up? Um, and so then I would be able to backtrack that and help them formulate a plan. Uh, but again, it's like, OD is your partner in this process. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my fear is really that we spend a lot of energy and investment on symptoms rather than the root cause. Or, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> give, give me three things I can do today and never have to think about it again. That's just not how it works. <laughs> so Matt, let's say one more question here. Let, let's say I uh, was CEO. I bring you in. I, I'm going to I, I trust you. I, I know that there's stuff I don't know. And I'm asking you to help us with uh, developing talent, organizational culture, some of those basic mm -hmm. OD organizational de development stuff. What are some of the first things you're going to be looking for? And, and why would you be looking for those as those first things? Yeah, it's really, again, yeah, not to, not to beat a dead horse, but the value system, we're looking at like, what, what, what are the values and how are they showing up? And that requires a lot of observations around decision making, who's making decisions, what's the communication patterns look like, um, is there psychological safety, um, what's kind of the lay of the land, what's the organizational structure, centralized, decentralized, I mean, there's, there, there's just so many elements, all of which paint a particular picture about how that company operates and what that culture is. Um, obviously, all of those data points, again, build a picture, but requires a lot of like interviews and uh, observations and so forth. So it requires a lot of listening, um, mm. a lot of listening. Mm. Boy, I, I would think if uh, I had a vision for something that had to 
be developed across you know a five to eight year period. We were really going to kind of flesh something out and grow it. This kind of work at the front end would be so valuable and would stave off all kinds of costs when you're having to do forensic work after something's blown up or it didn't didn't quite achieve its value. Right. And that's what I love about this whole, you know, defining your culture, cultural aim. Like, what is it that you're trying to accomplish and backtracking from mm -hmm. that? I think sometimes, again, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what it is right now. But, you know, I like to think of it more optimistically or uh, appreciatively and say, where are we going? And let's, mm -hmm. let's map, let's map out. Let's to map get to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, thank you very much. Yeah. We're, we're going to put Matt's uh, contact information on this on the screen. So uh, if you're thinking, boy, we've got to get into some organizational development thinking and strategy forming here, uh, here's a great resource for you. And we hope that you'll call on Matt. Uh, I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. Matt, thanks for joining me for this conversation. Thank you. And so we want to wish, wish you all well and say farewell for now. Bye-bye.